Let's go live with this. So I'm going to say testing, testing, testing. Just, um, David, give us your name. and. Sure. Um, yeah. So my name is David Coe, and I'm the uh, Senior Vice President running Daylight Partnership, um, recently acquired by Rudifin. And we're very excited about that. Well, that is exciting news. And, and thank you, David. I want to welcome you to 360 Conversations and to this Asia in the West podcast series. I think this is going to be a... Great conversation. Glad to be here. So let me start at what the beginning is, I think, of this. You and I have met before and we've had some terrific conversations over the last several years. When I mention the words conversations taking place between Asia and the West, what does that bring to mind for you? What does that mean to you? I think the, the end result of any conversation is understanding. It's it's empathy. I think it's really important to me that um, when we talk about this conversation that has to happen between the East and the West, that it's not just about an exchange of ideas. Um, it has to be the next step beyond that, which is the understanding of the other side's perspective, um, which is where empathy comes in. And we're, we're living in very uncertain times right now um, with what's happening in the political situation in the U.S. And uh, as we speak, we're, we're waiting for the president-elect to, to take his office. And what this means for those of us here in Asia, especially in greater China, um, is uncertain. And It's true been, of the other side, too. It's true. Uh, yeah. Definitely. We're I, all. I feel, mm -hmm. I feel for you as well. Um, there's a lot of posturing. There's a lot of open-ended questions, there's a lot of threats, um, not a lot of reassurance. And so I think myself and, and most other people within my industry, we're watching this very closely. And as a communicator, um, it, it makes me very sad. I mean, not just with the, the election results, but what happened throughout the, 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 the whole election process, this, um, this dissent into um, um, less than civilized behavior, um, this um, validation of bullying behavior, uh, it, it worries me. It worries me a lot, especially when we're in a time right now as a civilization or as a race that is facing so many um, species-threatening issues from you know, climate change to um, just um, cruelty between people, and, and I think it's, it's a step backwards. It's interesting, isn't it, since we know that we've never been more technologically sophisticated and mm. should, be, should be aided by that in our communication, and yet I, I, um, I feel that we've stopped conversation in, in, in many directions. Um, so your comments are, are well-founded, and I'm... I'm you have an interesting position now, having joined River Finn, which is headquartered in New York City. So you really do have a, you have a foot in the West, if not, if not more than a foot. You've been um, very involved in Western kind of views and, and business mm -hmm. issues, yes. as well as Asian, specifically Chinese. So this is a special time for you too, mm -hmm. I guess. So how well do you think Westerners? understand Chinese, the China world? I think it's difficult to generalize, mm -hmm. but um, I think understanding comes from um, this uh, intake of information, whether it comes from the media or their own research, but of course, you know, primarily these days, media, and also what they hear and see from their peers in social media. And I would say that the people that understand Asia the most are the ones that have actually visited mm. and have come here and not as tourists but actually have been here Spent for more than a time. week. Yes. Spent some time here working with us, talking with us, um, just trying to be a part of the, the culture and the environment here. I think that's very important. There's, there's nothing more effective than actually being here. I mean you can get a lot of information from reading social media, reading the news, what you come across in the media, but a lot of that is secondhand. What you read in the media is what someone has written or produced a video of. 
Um, and that is always through the lens of somebody's eyes and someone's perspective. And so nothing beats that firsthand exposure. Well, I think you, you, we've talked about this. My, I've said for years, face-to-face -face conversation has become the new luxury. I'm changing that in my head now. I think it's the face-to-face -face conversation has become a requirement, mm. at least a place to start. And then we can use technology till the cows come home because we, we've met, we've mm. sort of physically experienced each other in a way that is, 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 you just, you just understand people better when you've, been in the in their presence mm, absolutely and you also need to bring a very open attitude um, of just accepting that you don't know what you don't know i think a lot of people even though they bring themselves to these face-to-face -face conversations they come with preconceived ideas uh, of what the other side is like how they think how they behave and i think a, a very important part of getting the most value out of these conversations it's just coming to them with no expectations. You know, I, 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 I think you know I agree with that. I've, I've often said that, uh, to quote a man named Theodore Zeldin, who's kind of one of my heroes, he's an Oxford dean, a former Oxford dean, and he wrote a book called Conversations, and in it he says that great conversations require that each person come to it with the intent to be changed by it. And that's just what you're saying. You, you have to, I, I call it having beginner's ears, mm -hmm. assuming you never heard whatever it is they're going to say before and you can't wait to learn it. That's just different. It Absolutely. just makes you listen differently, right? Open heart, open mind, right? Yeah. So now what about the other way around? How well do Asians, specifically Chinese, understand the Western culture or what's happening in the West? I think we have a, a bit more of an advantage by virtue of just um, this enormous cultural force that is Hollywood. I think uh, many Asians, most Asians growing up, they, they've, they've had a lot of exposure to, if not Western culture, very definitely American culture, just through what they see in film and TV and mm -hmm. music and all of that. I'm not saying that that's representative of what people in the West are really like, but I think that a lot of that does come through 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 osmosis, and I think that in a way um, we've been exposed to more. Um, does that necessarily help the understanding? I'm not entirely sure, but there are definitely a lot of stereotypes that are very ingrained into um, Asians like myself growing up over here, mm -hmm. but watching American movies growing up. I think that's a, a very distinct um, experience. Um, I don't think I could say the same for the other way around. You're right. You're right. You can't. Um, and that has led, I think, in some cases, it's not just misinformation, it's just a lack of information. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the curiosity that should go along with that on the part of Westerners. So what about, thinking about business specifically, what about this recent slowdown or downturn in the Chinese economy. Has that had an impact on your clients, on your work? Is it, what's your, what's your thought about that? What, what's happening? I think undeniably, undeniably the, the slowdown has affected a lot of companies and I think our company as well to a lesser extent. Um, we are fortunate in that we operate kind of on the more digital mm -hmm. edge of the business, of the marketing industry. So a lot of clients, um, when they decide to dial back their budgets, um, digital is one area where they're continuing to increase their, their investments. And so we've been very fortunate simply by virtue of being in that area of the industry. But I think a lot of other areas are, are hurting. So traditional advertising is definitely hurting um, because a lot of clients are moving budgets away from that um, and going into social media and so on. Um, but it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I say this now, um, like I mentioned earlier, about the uncertainties. For example, if the trade war does erupt between America and China, how that would affect us over here remains to be seen. And would that um, contribute to uh, accelerating the slowdown? Or on the contrary, would it actually um, drive domestic consumption to the point where we actually see an uptick? It's, um, it's difficult to predict right now. It's fascinating, too, because that's China's intent to increase that internal consumption, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're trying to move away from a strictly manufacturing export 
powerhouse to something more internally focused, mm -hmm. right? I think China needs to move away from being the factory of the world yeah. you know, into you know higher service sector uh, um, um, economies, right? So it's really trying to move up the food chain and in parallel to that, driving domestic consumption so that China is producing and manufacturing more for the people over here than the West because I think it's increasingly obvious now that that is not sustainable and China cannot continue to just make mm -hmm. um, widgets for people in Europe and America. It just doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So how in touch with you, how in touch are you with the millennials of, of mainland China? And if you feel that you are, you have a sort of a mm -hmm. finger on that pulse, how has this slowdown affected them at all? Is there is there any thought of oh my gosh maybe this gravy train doesn't continue because they've known nothing but exponential growth since they were born really mm. right the last three decades? What's the story there? So as a result of my involvement in Rudafin, I've been traveling very extensively within mainland China. Oh great! I'm actually delivering training to their offices in in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, um, and I would say. Um, Close to half of the people that work in Rudafin in China are millennials. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, with my company here in Hong Kong, 80% of us are millennials. Um, and so I have a lot of these conversations. I think there is a, um, a, an abiding pride in, in, their, in the progress of their country, speaking for the mainland millennials. Um, I think the slowdown concerns them slightly, but that optimism is always there. And uh, they know without any doubt that things will always get better. Um, and I see this as, this is a very fundamental optimism and it hasn't gone away. Um, there is also this increasing sense of confidence, this knowing impression or this knowing uh, notion that China is the future, mm. that um, like any civilization, you know, Western civilization will soon give way to perhaps an Eastern civilization. Uh, whether China will be the lead of that or a very important part of that remains to be seen. But signs now are, um, at least to the millennials in China that I speak to, signs are very clear that they see China as leading that growth into the next stage of, of um, civilization. It's where the action is. It's where the action is. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we get used to talking about Western civilization, but I think you hear a lot of talk about Eastern civilization and how that is the future for the human race. Now, coupled with that is also this growing sense of responsibility that we cannot rely on the West to solve problems of the human race. So China increasingly understands that they have a huge role to play, say, in climate change. In solving that problem and I think a lot of the people that I talked to they wouldn't be surprised if a um, technological solution to climate change came out of the East over the next decade um, they would not be surprised by that at all because they do see it as perhaps if the West lacks the political will to make a change perhaps that needs to come from countries in Asia well it seems as if in fact it represents a big opportunity because in the West, there are a lot of people who are denying that there even is an issue. But you don't have to travel too far into mainland China to know that there aren't many deniers about what's happening with pollution because it surrounds you. Absolutely. So, I mean, they see it. They yeah, live it. They breathe yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I, th that, 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 I, think, I think it could end up that China takes the lead on that and to the world's benefit, but definitely to its own, which is fascinating. Um, so... You mentioned that the technological solution to that and other stuff would come possibly from mm. the East, and specifically China. So what about innovation? Where does it come from within China? I think it wasn't more than just several years ago that in conversations you were part of them, mm. I think, where there were a lot of people saying, well, you know, they have rote learning in their schools, they don't really have critical thinking, they kind of turn out these kids who you know, are not going to be innovators. And lo and behold, despite that educational uh, so-called barrier, they're turning out tons of stuff, right? Mm. So where is that coming from? Is it homegrown? Is it is it Chinese who are educated in the West and bringing, bringing that critical thinking back? 
It's certainly not expats. There aren't enough of them, and that sort of changed, right? What what where's the what's the source? I think it's it's a growing sense of um, like I say, confidence. So mm-hmm. there's this understanding that we don't always have to look to the West to lead, to um, provide the environment for for innovation. Uh, of course, um, people still talk about Silicon Valley. People still talk a lot about um, venture capitalists and so on. Um, but what I'm sensing and in talking to a lot of people, especially young people, is this growing confidence that they can innovate, they can invent, and they know that sooner or later uh, they will reach that critical mass of just um, one invention sparking off another um, and just having this wave of innovation kind of roll through. Uh, not just China, but I think all over yeah. uh, uh, Northern Asia as well. Um, a lot of that is indeed just for people being exposed to the West, perhaps having worked and lived in the West, coming back to Asia. We're definitely seeing that. Um, there's a, an increase in people who were educated in the West coming back to China um, and building businesses and becoming entrepreneurs. And I think that will be the catalyst for driving that innovation forward. Um, but I think underlying all of this is just, it's almost, almost like giving ourselves permission to lead the world and not have mm. this notion of, oh, we, we are derivative, we are not inventive, we, we copy. I think um, that might have been true 10 years, 20 years ago, but I think looking forward 10 years, 20 years, we'll see a lot of people say, I invented this, no one in the U.S. has this, and I'm going to change the world with this. And I think having that confidence to say that and believe in it um, is something that wasn't there before. And I'm seeing it in a lot of young people that I talk to today. Really? So it's very encouraging. That's exciting. So how does that fit with what gets reported, at least in the West, uh, as, a, as a movement of a number of people who have a lot of wealth to be leaving mainland China? Is that correct? Are they leaving China or are they just buying properties elsewhere because they're smart about moving their assets. I think it is true that there are many ultra-wealthy people that are either trying to leave China or, to your point, um, diversifying their their wealth um, beyond China. Um, I think the key is actually not whether they're moving the wealth away, but are they also... Um, perhaps using that wealth to fund innovation within China. And, and I think so. I think a lot of these industrialists, very successful billionaires, um, you know, the plutocrats, they actually, while they're moving their wealth away, they're still contributing to um, investing in a lot of um, interesting, exciting things happening inside China. Not perhaps out of any altruistic motives. It's just that it's their way to maintain their competitive edge. It's a smart thing to do because... If they want to stay at the top, they need to innovate. They need to find the next great thing. And so they're not going to be stingy about using their wealth to drive that. So do you have some examples of that? I think Vander is, is a great example. I mean, this is one company where it's headed by a billionaire, came out of real estate development, but they've now expanded into lots of new areas. And How do you spell that? Is it V-A-N-D-A. Um, Alibaba is another great example. I think uh, Jack Ma is, is, a, is a, a very inspiring individual, founded this company uh, that uh, grew e-commerce to the point now where it actually exceeds um, the scale of uh, even, even the West. And I think that he's nurtured a lot of innovation and he continues to fund a lot of VC funds around uh, Greater China. So he's someone that I think stands up and says, if you have a good idea, we will fund it. Um, don't worry about not getting the support. So it's really up to the innovators now, the inventors, to actually come out and say, I have this great idea and I think it's going to change the world. Uh, please help me. I need a vehicle for I it. I need a vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I think it's there. I mean, five years ago, we probably might not say it's easy to get funding, but that's rapidly changing. I think. Places like Hong Kong, Shanghai have become startup hubs, um, not at the scale of Silicon Valley, admittedly, but... Watch I our think, smoke. Watch our know, smoke, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this, this 
this understanding that if you have something that works and can gain traction, you will get funding. I think that's there. That is no longer a myth. It's actually true. Wow, that that that's potentially highly significant. Mm -hmm. So um, you brought up Jack Ma, and his company has now purchased the South China Morning Post. What do you think about that? Is that is that um, there are people that I've talked with since I mean this is brand new that they've been, they've, they've put in a new CEO who's a uh, an American, Chinese background, but basically an American, a tech guy, not mm -hmm. a journalist. There are people that I've talked to who say, oh, well, you know, really, Jack Ma's made a deal with the Chinese government, and this is really going to be the voice of mainland China. And there are others who say, no, he's really serious about having this be something that comes out of Hong Kong and represents a view of China that hasn't been expressed before. Mm. Where do you sit in your guess about all that? I think the simple answer is no one knows yet. Mm. Um, if you talk about this pivot towards greater emphasis on China, you know, both in coverage and in editorial direction, that happened way before Jack Ma came on the scene. I mean, I, I used to be in public relations, and so we work with journalists at the Post all the time. And I would say starting 10 years ago, mm -hmm. the focus has always been they want to do more stories on China. And so this, this pivot towards China is nothing new. Um, I think the question mark on everyone's minds right now is the impartiality of the post. Can they stay um, neutral? Neutral. Can they maintain that third party point of view? I think that remains to be seen. I, I think there are some valid concerns, but um, Jack Ma is not dumb. I think if he knows that he wants to maintain the value of the post as an independent voice, he needs to give it that independence, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that he would. I don't think that he would kill it. Well, you know, it's potentially a very big deal because mm -hmm. there is no real source that is highly recognized globally mm -hmm. for that. I mean, it's it sort of is, except you don't find. I know that more people read the post or read what they find on the post mm -hmm. online or mm -hmm. uh, or otherwise outside of Hong Kong than within Hong Kong. I did, I did hear that recently. But still, if you ask the man on the street in New York City, what do you think about the South China Morning Post, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think the opportunity for it to become really a global dynamo based on technology is kind of thrilling. I think that potential is definitely there. Um, to your point about the man on the street in New York not having heard of the South China Morning Post, um, they're actually globally accessible because they, I know. You know they have they have a website. They're on Facebook, um, and in a sense, they offer a counterbalance to the coverage that you might read in the New York Times. Indeed, or the Economist, or the FT. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Right? Um, and which may not necessarily always be pro-China. In fact, it rarely is. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of the New York Times, and. Uh, even so, I sometimes read articles there that I don't agree. And, uh, and it's interesting just to see how um, liberal sometimes, I, I, you know, I, I know that their correspondents here on the ground in, in China and Hong Kong, um, they tend to be very liberal, and, I, and I, especially during the whole Occupy um, mm -hmm. Central thing. I think that uh, a lot of the, the, the articles that I read were, I, I felt slightly off balance went over the line of not being totally neutral as yeah, they should be. Yeah. That's, a, that's a challenge of journalism in general, right? Um, what about the issue of privacy? Mm -hmm. You know, in the West, we throw pictures of ourselves that we shouldn't put out there for the world to see, and yet we are manic about, or I guess I should say rabid, about people getting hold of our data. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be so true in China. Is that something that is, however, is that where where does that all stand, and does it matter? I think there's a generational difference there. I think the the younger generation, the millennials, so to speak, they don't mind. Um, they they understand that it's part of the bargain of having access to a lot of these new technologies and social sharing platforms that their information will be used to target them for advertising, for example. 
Um, I think the older generation probably still tends to be a little bit careful about that, uh, especially those that um, uh, lived through a time in China where it was more oppressive. Mm -hmm. um, they, they might feel a little bit uh, cautious. But I think the younger generation, I don't see this being even an issue for them at all. It's, it's a non-issue. Um, but what I find really interesting is um, if you take Instagram as an example, um, no one reads the terms and conditions when you sign up to Instagram. No one, they, you know, they just kind of go, go mm -hmm. through it. But if they did, I think a lot of people in the West would be very surprised because um, it states very, very clearly in, in the terms that um, Instagram has the rights to use your pictures, um, re resell them. Um, they have uh, perpetual rights to use your content and all of that. And a lot of people, I don't think they understand that. And whatever you put onto Instagram, you no longer own. Uh, although officially you still own it, but Instagram can basically do whatever they want with your pictures. And so in that sense, you've lost control of Big your IP. Big implications, yeah. Right? Um, but then, you know, Instagram is still growing, Facebook is still growing, and people don't seem to be bothered by that. So I think um, this concern about privacy, it, it, it tends to be a little bit of a minority. I think mm. the majority, majority of people on social media, they don't seem very concerned about it. Now that being said, um, there is a movement now of people um, sharing less on public social platforms like Facebook and sharing more in closed circle platforms like uh, WhatsApp mm -hmm. um, or, or even Facebook Messenger. And I think that is a reaction to not wanting to be um, as public and wanting to really truly go back to the basics of why they were on social media in the first, in the first place, place. Mm -hmm. which is to share with people that you know um, and not be bombarded with sponsored messages and advertising. And I think there is a growing backlash today. So it's less about privacy, I think. It's more about going back to basics and going back to why they went onto social media in the first place. You brought up um, what happened with the um, democracy movement that occurred here. Mm -hmm. Was that three years ago? Mm -hmm. How long ago? Yeah. Okay, three years ago. Um, what's the future of Hong Kong in, in your mind? Are you still bullish about it? And how? what's it going to be like five years, ten years from now? I think there's two ways of looking at that. Um, I continue to be on a daily basis, encouraged by the quality of the people that I work with here. Um, Hong Kong still has a lot of um, uh, bedrock advantages that haven't changed, um, whether it's rule of law, um, you know, the, uh, the civil service. Those have not changed. And I think that a lot of people in Hong Kong forget that in this city, we still have some of the highest living standards in the world. Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of these factors that contributed to the success of Hong Kong in the first place, they're still there. Um, if anything, Hong Kong is becoming more global because there are lots more expats that are coming in here every day. There are expats leaving too, but I think uh, as, a, as, a, as a place where you get a lot of transient global talent, I think Hong Kong still has it. Um, and now, in addition, Hong Kong has this... Um, uh, neighbor to the north that presents a huge market for a lot of people here to um, uh, move on to a greater stage. And so I think for people in Hong Kong that don't see China as an obstruction, but see China as an opportunity, there's a lot of growth ahead of them. And um, I respect the need or the desire for greater control of their destiny um, I am completely in favor of greater democracy in Hong Kong. Um, I don't think that transition has been managed very well. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, I also see a lot of opportunity for Hong Kong because we have many of these ingredients for success that haven't really changed. And I think that sometimes in the hubbub of all the noise that we created because of our dissent or dissatisfaction with the administration, we lose sight of that. And I, I always speak to my team here, um, like I said, 80% millennials. I always say, 
keep fighting for what you believe in, but don't let your outrage blind you from the opportunities that are ahead of you. Um, you need to strike a balance. And I think if we can maintain that balance, there's still a lot of growth ahead of us in Hong Kong, but not just within Hong Kong as a market, but Hong Kong as a stage on which to expand into other markets. That sounds like good advice. So is there anything that we haven't talked about, so anything that's on your mind that you think is relevant to this whole issue of Asia and the West? The one thing that continues to worry me every day um, is the echo chamber effect of social media. Um, being in digital marketing, I, I live in social media every day, mm -hmm. and I see this happening firsthand. And even with the election in, in the U.S., this whole controversy over fake news. Um, I, I think social media has the capacity to do great good, and I think it has benefited us over the last uh, couple of decades, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But it also has the opportunity to do great harm to the human race. And I think that it has the, the possibility of polarizing people. Um, if you take Facebook, for example, um, because Facebook will do everything they can to keep you on their platform, they will try their best to serve up what you want to read and what you want to be exposed to. And it's, uh, it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So you tell Facebook what you like to read and what you like to be exposed to, basically what you agree with, and they will only show you that. Which means and that we're only listening to people like us. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so the, you form this echo chamber of believing that your views are the only view. Your, what you think is the best thing. You're right all the time. And you gradually become distanced from dissenting voices, from opposing views. Well, that certainly did happen in this election. That was Absolutely. pretty globally Absolutely. obvious, wasn't yeah. it? And the election was a great example of how that can harm us and multiply that effect across hundreds of different social issues. Um, and you have the world in a very dangerous place. Isn't it ironic? Because it should be just the opposite, that we've never had more of an opportunity to be truly informed. So... Yeah, I think, I think it's because social media uh, or Facebook started out as a way for people to communicate and share. I think where it went off the rails is when these companies decided that they were going to be the curator of mm -hmm. what you see and what you read and what you hear. And they don't do this with any malicious intent, I know. But the commercial dictates of running the business that has to turn a profit has led them down this path of self-reinforcing or creating these echo chambers. And inadvertently, they made a world a more dangerous place. And that worries me every day. So what do you think the antidote is? How do we... Spend less time on social media. <laughs> yeah. So what I do is, so uh, <laughs> as my, my New Year's resolutions for uh, 2017 is, uh, one of 10 is make an active effort to go out and listen to opposing views. Um, subscribe to Fox News. Subscribe to Breitbart. Mm -hmm. you know, listen to people that you used to have a tendency to just dismiss outright, um, what is to you crackpot? There might be that kernel of truth there that you have to respect and understand. And I would also urge people on the other side of the, the spectrum to do that too. And I know it's not easy because social media makes it so easy to tune out opposing mm -hmm. views. And so you actually have to make an active effort to go out and get it. You know, it's a, in a way, it's re, it, it, we've come full circle in the conversation because it's reflective of the value, as you said, of people going to a place where they are, in fact, different, where they may be uncomfortable in another culture. And, of course, that's where the wisdom begins. So you're right. In a way, we, we need to do this on a, on a couple levels, not only on social media, but actually get people into places where they have not lived before. And that, that personal connection can mean a lot. Well, this looks like a great place to stop, actually, David. This has been terrific. I so appreciate your, your comments and your perspectives. They're always so wise. Thanks for having me. So thanks for being part of Asia in the West. And um, I hope we talk again soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks.